Okay, so today we will be beginning a five-week program on what are called the four protective meditations. Yeah, please find a seat, any kind of comfortable seat. There are seats over here. Okay, the four protective meditations are a group of meditation subjects which are found amongst the 40 meditation objects in the Visuddhimagga. But the early teachers in the Theravada tradition have sort of selected them and put them into this group because they form, as the name indicates, they perform a protective function. And often in long-term meditation, when one undertakes a long-term meditation retreat in countries of South and Southeast Asia, the meditation teacher will have the beginning meditators begin usually for a full day doing the four protective meditations. Or sometimes they'll do four days. If it's a really long retreat, they'll begin with four days and on each day one spends the whole day doing one of the protective meditation uh, subjects. Okay, so what are the four protective meditation subjects? They are Buddha Nusati, which means recollection of the Buddha or mindfulness of the Buddha. Then Metta Bhavana, the meditation on loving kindness. Then the Asuba Bhavana, which is the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body, focusing on the 32 parts of the body. And then Marana Sati, the mindfulness of death. And so over the next four weeks, we'll be devoting one Saturday to each of these meditation subjects individually. Then on the fifth Saturday, we will bring them all together in one, one day's session. Okay, so the four meditation subjects, they are called protective meditations because each performs a particular protective function in relation to our cultivation, our spiritual practice. And the four begin with Buddha Nusati, recollection of the Buddha, because it's the trust, confidence, faith in the Buddha that serves as the basis or foundation for the whole development of the Buddha's path. And so when we enter the door of the Buddha Dhamma, you don't enter the door of the Buddha Dhamma by doing mindfulness of breathing or vipassana. You enter the door of the Buddha Dhamma by going for refuge. And the first refuge that you go to is buddhang sarananga chami. I go for refuge to the Buddha. And so when you develop mindfulness or recollection of the Buddha, then it's sort of like watering the seed of faith or confidence. So instead of just being like a transitory, uh, imp <laughs> impermanent interest in Buddhism, or just the taking up the practice of meditation to have a calm, some calmness in one's everyday life. This becomes a way of firmly rooting the mind in one's commitment to the Buddha Dharma. And so recollection of the Buddha, as I said, it waters the seed of faith so that it sends down roots, firm roots, and sends forth the sprout which will eventually grow and bring forth the flowers and the fruits of Buddhist realization. Okay, and so mindfulness of the Buddha protects one's mind and one's practice by maintaining one's conviction in the efficacy of the Buddha Dhamma and one's commitment to learning and practicing the Buddha Dharma. 
Okay, then, mind, then the meditation on loving kindness, of course, is a protection against one of the most destructive forces in the human mind, that is anger and hate, hatred. And so as we practice meditation on loving kindness, then we are developing a feeling of goodwill and empathy for others, the altruistic motivation to help others, and that will weaken and suppress and eventually help us to overcome those unwholesome tendencies towards anger, ill will, and hatred. Then the Asubha Bhavana, the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body. This is taught especially by the Buddha to monks and nuns because one of the biggest forces that one has to deal with in maintaining the monastic life is sensual desire, sensu especially sexual lust. And so when one looks into the nature of the body and sees what the body really consists of, that helps to weaken this tendency to lust. And though it's taught by the Buddha originally to the monastics, I know in Sri Lanka many lay people go to the monasteries and practice this meditation because it helps to take the edge off the force of sensual desire. Okay, then the fourth protective meditation is the meditation on death, the recollection on, of death. Of course, it's not the most <laughs> pleasant meditation subject in the book, <laughs> but it's extremely beneficial because it helps us to remind us of our own mortality. You know, when we get immersed in our involvements in this life, we lose sight of what's really important. And we take minor things, trivial things, and we blow up their importance and we get completely swept away by them. But when one does the meditation on death, remembering that all of us, particularly I myself, have to face that moment, which I never know when it will occur, when everything that I identify with is ripped away from me, then I realize the need to sort out what's important, what is trivial, what is a distraction, and devote myself to what is truly important, what is truly of value in this fleeting existence of ours. Okay, so that is sort of general overview of the four protective meditations. And of the four, always in the traditional sequence, they always begin with recollection of the Buddha. And recollection of the Buddha, this also becomes very important in a somewhat different form in, well, it's very important in the Theravada tradition, but also it plays a major role in Mahayana Buddhism. And it might have been one of the factors that led to the development of Mahayana. So that we have a particular school in Mahayana Buddhism, which is really built entirely upon recollection of the Buddha. This is the Pure Land School which is <clears throat> based on devotion to the Buddha Amitabha. Or um, here you hear, when you meet people, they go, Amitabha. That doesn't mean, <laughs> I wish you a good day, or how are you today, but it means homage to Amitabha Buddha. Okay, in the Theravada tradition, recollection of the Buddha works through calling to mind the qualities of the Buddha. It's not reciting the Buddha's name, but bringing to mind the qualities, the distinctive special qualities of the Buddha. And there are nine qualities which come down repeatedly in the suttas. And so the recollection of the Buddha is a process of calling to mind these nine qualities, sort of revolving them like a wheel in the mind, so that one goes through each of the qualities and brings it briefly to mind and then passes on to the next quality. 
and we use sort of in the background or as a focus point for bringing to mind the qualities of the Buddha and image of the Buddha. As I explained in the email, this isn't an exercise in visualization. It's quite different from the Tibetan, some of the Tibetan meditations in which one has to visualize in great detail, painstaking detail, each aspect of a scene in which the Buddha is present, beginning with visualizing his lotus seat, and then the flowers growing on his side, and then each aspect of the Buddha's physical appearance. Here, it's just sufficient to have a general image of the Buddha as a kind of focus point. But the key to the practice is bringing to mind the qualities of the Buddha. And there are nine qualities that are mentioned repeatedly in the suttas. And so I'm going to explain each of these qualities, and then we will go into a guided meditation on these qualities. Okay, and each of these qualities has uh, numerous like levels or shades of meaning. And if you really understand the nine qualities of the Buddha, in a way I could say you don't even have to read the Tripitaka. All the nine, all the entire Tripitaka, you could say, all the three collections of the Buddha's teachings are included within the nine qualities of the Buddha. Okay, so I will now go through and explain the nine qualities. And the way the practice develops, usually when one does it over an extended time, one begins by getting thoroughly acquainted with the nine qualities, then one starts stripping away qualities till one reduces to three qualities, then works with three qualities, deepens one's focus on the three qualities, then eliminates two until one has just one quality. And of course, the qualities that one eliminates and the ones we that one retains depends upon one's individual preferences, inclinations. But since we're practicing in a group today, I'm going to <laughs> take the initiative in deciding what three stay. <laughs> but I'll leave you to choose the last one for yourself. Okay, then of the nine qualities now, we begin with arahan. So the formula goes, first let me recite the whole formula. Iti piso bhagava arahang samma sambuddho vija charana sampanno sugato loka vidu anuttaro purisa dhammasarati satta deva manusanang buddho bhagava. Okay, so it begins, it starts with itipi so bhagava, which means the blessed one is, then the first one is arahang, or arahat. So the Buddha, you know, just like his great disciples, is an arahat. And the word arahat, it was not a word original to Buddhism, but it was a word that, would have, that was in circulation in India during the Buddha's time, to indicate the spiritually accomplished person, the one who had gained liberation. And so the Buddha took this word over and brought it into his own teaching to indicate the person who has gained liberation. And so the Buddha, since he had gained liberation, he's first of all arahat, arahan. Please, if you're joining the meditation program, you come, you could find any, there's a seat here. Then take, you could take, sit along the side. Okay, so the word arahang comes from a root which means to be worthy, to be deserving. And so the Buddha is called arahang in the sense that he is worthy of veneration worthy of respect, worthy of offerings, worthy of praise. 
And then what makes him Arahan worthy of veneration, this is the second aspect of Arahan, is that he is fully purified, that he is one who has eliminated permanently and completely all the defilements of the mind. He is one who has eliminated all greed, all hatred, all delusion. So he's fully purified, the mind stream is fully purified. All of those defilements have been cut down at the root so that they are incapable of arising again in the future. And by cutting down all the defilements, the Buddha is liberated from the cycle of birth and death. He's cut off all of the, the defilements are the bonds or fetters that keep one tied to the cycle of birth and death. And so the Buddha is one who has broken the bonds and has gained the ultimate freedom, the ultimate liberation. Okay, so we could bear this in mind as the three meanings of Arahang, that he's the worthy one or holy one, the one who deserves veneration and praise. He's the fully purified one who's eliminated all the defilements. And he is the liberated one, freed forever from the cycle of birth and death. Okay, then the next quality is Samma Sambuddho, which means Samma, it's perfectly, or fully, completely, Sambuddho, enlightened, awakened. And so we, we bring these together, Samma Sambuddho, the perfectly enlightened one. And this is explained to mean that the Buddha is the one who has achieved the knowledge or understanding of all dhammas, which I would take to mean all the sp sp spiritual principles of the universe. Like he's eliminated not only the defilements, not only the gross ignorance, but he's eliminated all the obstructions to cognition. So he's able to know whatever he wishes to know. Sometimes Sama Sambuddho is explained in terms of omniscience, but I don't think that the Buddha would have been omniscient in the sense that in 500 BC, he would have known how to operate Word version 10. <laughs> I mean, he would have had no idea that someday <laughs> Word version 10 would exist. <laughs> but whatever relates to the processes of defilement and bondage, to the process of liberation, all of the defilements, all of the aids to enlightenment, all of the different stages of realization, everything that's set down in the Tripitaka, you could say is testimony to the vast, almost unobstructed knowledge, cognition of the Buddha. And all of that is compressed in this expression, Sama Sambuddho, perfectly enlightened one. Okay, the next quality is Vija Charana Sampano, which means one who is endowed with good conduct, good behavior, and knowledge, clear knowledge. So the good conduct of the Buddha, you could see, is exemplified by his flawless behavior, that there are never any faults in his bodily actions, in his speech, never speaks with anger towards anyone, 
never makes rough movements, but he's always acts ethically and ethically upright ways, always acting, all of his behavior is governed by mindfulness and clear comprehension. His senses are restrained. His demeanor is calm and peaceful, inspiring trust in others. And he's devoted to a life of simplicity, even though he's surrounded by many disciples, but he's devoted inwardly to seclusion, to solitude. And he's mastered all the different levels of the meditative attainments. So all of this comes under the conduct, endowed with good conduct. And then he's also endowed with clear knowledge. And this is explained by the commentaries to know that, to mean that he knows all of his past lives going back countless aeons. He has the divine eye through which he can see other world systems and can see how other beings pass away and take rebirth in accordance with their karma. And he knows that in his own mind he's destroyed the asavas, the defilements. Okay, so all of this is sort of summed up in the expression endowed with good conduct and clear knowledge. Okay, the next quality is sugato, which means the prefix su means good or indicates good, and gata means gone. So putting them together, we could render this literally as well gone. And the Buddha said to be well gone, first in the sense that he has gone to the ultimate good, which is Nibbana, that he lives perpetually experiencing the bliss of Nibbana. So we could say that he's well gone and that he's gone to the blissful state. And also it said that he's well gone in that he has traveled along the good path, that is the Noble Eightfold Path. Okay, now if you look at these qualities that I've mentioned so far, Arahang, that's the worthy one, the perfectly enlightened one, the one with, clear, with good conduct and clear knowledge, and the well-gone one, those are all pertaining to the Buddha's own achievements. With the next quality, we begin to see what I would say is a movement from the Buddha's own inward achievements to his relationship to the world. So this one is called Loka Vidu, which means knower of the worlds, or knower of the world. And the Buddha is called this first because he's known the cons constituents or the constitution of the entire cosmos. He knows all of the different realms of existence and all of the, the beings dwelling in the different realms. And so in this way, he's a knower of the world. But also he's a knower of this world in that through his special super knowledge, he's able to cast his vision out upon the world and to see the minds of the people of the world, to understand what are their strengths and weaknesses, what are their um, underlying tendencies, their potential defilements, their potential um, strengths and potentials for awakening. He can understand their different interests, 
inclinations, proclivities, preferences. And so he has this comprehensive understanding of the mental makeup of countless living beings, countless human beings. And in this way, he's always able to adjust his teaching to fit the particular situation, to fit the specific needs and interests and inclinations of the people being taught. So that is why when you read the suttas, you could see when the Buddha meets, say, an angry Brahmin, he knows exactly how to teach. Actually, I'm coming into the next characteristic. L let me stop with that. Okay, so this is Lokavidu, the knower of the world. Then the next one is in Pali, Anuttaro Purisa Dhammasarati, that is the unsurpassed trainer of people to be tamed. So this quality or this designation indicates the Buddha's ability to train, to discipline, to tame people with such different qualities, characteristics, interests, and so on. So the Buddha had you know, count of many, many monk disciples, nun disciples, layman disciples, laywoman disciples, and he was able to teach each of them or all of them in the ways that best suited their dispositions, their capacities for understanding and realization. And, realization. and sometimes the Buddha would meet people who are very difficult to tame, like there's a sutta where the angry Brahmin comes to the Buddha and speaks to him in very angry tones. And then the Buddha speaks to him in such a way and gives him the precise teaching so that the Brahmin becomes you know, surprised at the patience, the gentleness, the acuity of the Buddha's reply. And then the Brahmin develops faith in the Buddha and asks to become a monk and becomes an arhat. And the Buddha met, for example, the debaters, some of the very skillful debaters amongst the Brahmins, the Jains. And when he would engage them in debate, he was able to subdue them so that they developed trust in the Buddha. And he met the serial killer, Angulimala, who had killed many people and cut off their fingers to make a necklace, necklace of finger bones around his neck. And the Buddha was able to tame him and make him a monk and in time an arahat. So the Buddha was able to, to tame and to train even the most difficult people to train. And so that's why we call him the unsurpassed trainer of people to be tamed. Okay, then the next quality is Sattā Deva Manusānaṁ, the teacher of humans and deities. In a way, this quality seems similar to the previous one, but I think maybe the emphasis here is simply on the Buddha's role, not so much in taming and subduing those who are stubborn and intractable, but rather just the general aspect of being a teacher to countless human beings and many deities, always pointing out to them what is unwholesome, what is wholesome, what is harmful, what is helpful, what is um, unwholesome, what is wholesome, what leads to their defilement, what leads to their purification and liberation. So the Buddha is the sattā, the teacher, in that his teaching brings benefit to countless humans and de even the deities. We see in the suttas, particularly in the Sangyutta Nikaya, in the depths of the night when the rest of the world is sleeping, the deities come to the Buddha to ask questions and then the Buddha answers them. Okay, so we have teacher of devas and human beings. Then we have Buddha, 
which seems rather similar, Buddha, the enlightened one, similar to the second one, which is Sama Sambuddha, perfectly enlightened one. So I asked myself, what is the difference between Buddha and Sama Sambuddha? And just the way I would explain it is that Buddha here indicates that the Buddha is one who first has become enlightened to, has understood specifically the Four Noble Truths and also takes on the role of being the enlightener, that is, the, the one who conveys enlightenment to others. So he's not only enlightened within himself, but he is the one who enlightens others, who brings others the light of wisdom, who awakens them from the sleep of ignorance. Okay, then the ninth and the last epithet of the Buddha is Bhagava. And this is usually translated blessed one, which I don't think it's so satisfactory, though I use it myself, since it seems to suggest that somebody greater than the Buddha has blessed him, which is not the case. But the word Bhagava means one who possesses the factors of good fortune. So one might also render it the fortunate one. And what's explained, what the commentaries explain, Bhagava, at least one of the explanations, is that the Buddha is the one who has completed the practice of the paramis, the paramitas, so the paramitas are the qualities of good fortune. And the Buddha, by practicing them to the end, has acquired this good fortune. So the paramis, or paramitas, I'll use the six from the Mahayana tradition, since it's a more concise set. So it's giving, or generosity, sila, virtuous conduct, patience, energy, meditation, meditative absorption, and wisdom. So the Buddha has developed all of these six to their fulfillment, to their perfection. And so by de developing these six qualities to perfection, the Buddha has become the blessed one. And as the blessed one, he's the one who extends blessings out upon the world. So he's the source of, I would say, the source of the waves of blessing which spread out through the world. The waves of blessing generated by his loving kindness and his great compassion so that when we attune our minds to the Buddha, to the qualities of the Buddha, then we absorb the power of his blessings even though the Buddha has passed away 2,500 years ago, but the waves or the current of blessings are still spreading out through the world. And we could, by calling the quali to mind the qualities of the Buddha, then we attune our own mind to the blessing power of the Buddha. It's a little bit like Okay, if I go onto the computer, okay, let us say um, Huffington Post, it's sick, you know, it's a, a news website, it's waves are spreading through this room right now. You know, we don't see them, can't touch them. But if I go onto this computer, get onto the internet, and then type into Google Huffington Post and click, um, enter, then Huffington Post appears. And so that's because I'm attuning the computer to the waves, the signals of Huffington Post. <laughs> and so in the same way, when I bring my mind into attunement with the Buddha by calling to mind the qualities of the Buddha, then I'm sort of absorbing or picking up the blessing power, the 
current of blessings coming from the Buddha, the current of the Buddha's loving kindness and compassion. And so this is some of the significance that I see embedded or embodied within that quality of Bhagava, the blessed one who is also the source of blessings. Okay, so this covers the explanation of the qualities of the Buddha. Do you want to stretch the legs for five minutes? Because we started at, yeah, it's now 10 after 10. We started here at nine. So let's stretch our legs. You could just even walk around a little, but don't get lost. And then exactly at 10, 15, then I'll start to explain the actual how to do the meditation practice based on the nine qualities of the Buddha. To be tamed, like you tame, tame an animal. 